Hey everybody, welcome back to another pandemic interviews. This time I'm talking with a gentleman, Kendall Wells, a friend of mine I met down in Los Angeles. Uh, Kendall is an actor, a stuntman. He's worked on shows like 68 Whiskey, uh, Jack Ryan, SWAT, Robert the Bruce, Fallen Angel, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, Kendall, thanks for joining me today and talking with me and telling us about how you got into all this stuff. Thank you. Thank you. It's great being here. My first question for you is, how did you get into stunt work? <laughs> that's, that's always a good question. <laughs> it's never an easy answer. Um, I, started, I started doing martial arts when I was about eight, um, and then I started acting i think my parents put me in like a theater program when i was 11 or 12 i think 11 and um i just kept doing both of those things because i happened to like them and then i was also martial arts martial arts wise i was inspired by um you know jackie chan and jet lee and all these all these other martial arts films and then of course also all these western european films as well like like you know um rob roy and braveheart and all these other films and so i um i didn't know exactly how to push forward with it but eventually i got i got hooked up with a um a fight coordinator or fight director for theater um back where i'm from in um in iowa and um i uh i started training with him when i was 14 or 15 i think and I started doing European weapons because that's what was available, and that was what was, um, you know, the stage combat version of of those weapons. And then when I was seventeen, I got hooked up with my my uh, mentor Anthony Delongis, which you know that's our mutual connection there as well. Um, and I started going out when I was seventeen. I started going out to Los Angeles and training privately with him, um, just because you know, I was passionate about it and I liked it not because I was being logical or reasonable in any way because you know it's there's it's it's a it's a weird industry and I didn't necessarily know how to pursue it but you know I if I get hooked up with the people who know quite a bit and I was lucky to fall in with Anthony um because there's a whole lot of misinformation out there about you know martial arts and weapons work and and stunt performance and fight performance and he's got a really high standard and uh it wasn't because I was educated that I ended up with him. I just happened to fall in with him because my parents went to the same chiropractor as him and they happened to exchange information. They're like, oh, my son, he's just, I, I was in an acting conservatory at the time. I was in a four year acting conservatory program. It was like a full time deal from 14 to about 18. And um, right at the end of that is when I got hooked up with Anthony. So very cool. It was fortunate, fortunate timing. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, happy coincidences will often change our life like that oh very much so here yeah so you've been obviously acting for a long time i didn't know that you had been practicing the craft that long so uh that makes a lot of sense and so one of the questions i want to ask is this is a perishable skill acting as well as stunt work how do you update your skills for stunt work and acting so that not only do they maintain, but more importantly, they, you can improve them? Um, that's a good question. Uh, practice, training. If you've, like, I've, I started martial arts when I was very young, and, it, and I knew that it took a consistent you know, repetition. It wasn't, I wasn't going to achieve anything incredible in a very short period of time. And I knew that. And I was told that, that it was beaten into my head from a very young age, and um, and same with acting. So I didn't think how quickly can I accomplish something. I just I put the time frame out of my head, and I just put my head down and and trained and did the work and uh, went to class. And um, again, not not a whole lot of thought as to the the business end of it. I just knew that if I committed to practicing and to practice and if i was honest about it and made the right connections hopefully something would come along that you know i'd be able to to uh, make money doing it and have a career but as far as like maintaining it that mentality just keeps going i you know i train daily with weapons um and as far as stunt performance goes uh there are workouts 
that, you know, I'm in the LA area, which is nice because there's a bunch of people to train with. Um, and I have students that I teach and in teaching, it keeps me honest as to my technique yeah. and, uh, and helps and helps keep me sharp. Um, which is great. Uh, acting wise, um, kind of the same, it's, it's the same principle. There's a lot of different acting, uh, academies and schools out there and there's a lot of them that definitely go into a weird place um and i prefer not to go into too weird a place with them um but you know if if you're doing taped auditions even doing you know one taped audition every once in a while helps keep things somewhat fresh um and i find that even even practicing martial arts has helped me acting wise um because with martial arts, it's a moment by moment process and you have to be honest and you have to be in the moment and you have to be listening and responding to your partner um, in real time. Yeah. You, can't, you can't take it apart all the time. You do when you're training and then when it's time to go, you got to stop thinking about it and do it. And, uh, and it's definitely the same thing acting wise. And my, my acting background, I had a really solid, um, I think six years probably when I was really young with um, Meisner Technique and a handful of others, but mostly, mostly it was Meisner. So, um, it's, uh, I was lucky for that, but yeah, train, train constantly, just train constantly, get good teachers, find people who, who click with you, um, and who, who can always teach you more. Yeah. That was actually going to be one of my questions and you already answered it is how did, how have you found that martial arts affects your acting career and your abilities? in your craft and i'd say you know i'd i'd say that it really depends not just it's not just any martial art but like a really good martial artist if you find a good teacher who's an honest teacher who teaches uh philosophy in its most um pure form i suppose that's the only time that it really becomes useful if i'm looking at something that's like entirely performance oriented if i'm looking at something like more uh more modern martial arts where you know you're spinning your swords around and they're all made of aluminum and they're all you're doing three back flips that doesn't have a whole lot of martial applicability to it um and i find that that's less useful for me acting wise i think that i think ha having a martial truth keeps me grounded Right. And um, that's the and that philosophically is the only thing that I find a through line to acting wise because I'm still trying to find when I'm acting. There's you know kernels of truth or ribbons of truth as Anthony has quoted Bruce Lee saying that run through whatever the scene is or whatever the context is of content. And um, being able to find that and break that down and really assimilate it um, only happens if you're training in um, a good honest martial art. Cool. Um, so you've done a lot of work on screen. Do you do stage work as well? I started with a stage. Um, actually, I, I, when you're doing um, acting, there's not a lot of options to get into film or it's easier to get into stage. And especially because my hometown, I'm not initially from the West Coast. I'm, I'm from Iowa and then I was in New York for a bit back to Iowa and uh, theater was the only thing that was available. Um, but fortunately my theater uh, school that I was at was also funded by like the biggest um, commercial uh, company in the Midwest and they do a lot of work with Disney and they fly people in and out. So I was, I was lucky to have that, that, um, that training as well from age 13, I think. Um, but yeah, I started in, in stage and I did, um, quite a bit of stage work doing, you know, uh, showcases and various things when I was younger. I didn't have as much of an interest in pursuing any particular plays. Um, I just wanted the training and then I'd have to do, I'd have to do the, uh, the demo at the end, the recital at the end as it were. And every now and then I'd, I'd do a different production. And then I started doing, I think I did, uh, my first commercial when I was like 13. And then uh, I moved to Portland, Oregon, and I was bouncing back and forth between Portland and Los Angeles. Um, and in Portland, I was doing stage work as well. I started doing stage work. So I started fight coordinating there um, and 
I was actually the first the first show that I did there was Romeo and Juliet and um I got uh I was given a, a regional theater award for for fight chore- outstanding fight choreography or something okay. like that and um that was co- I had no idea what it meant I I was I couldn't find I was just I was new to Portland I was late to the event um I had no idea how many people were going to be there and I got there and my girlfriend at the time was extremely mad at me cuz I Showed up late, didn't get my award. I didn't even know I was nominated for it. I didn't know anybody. I, I had no idea what I was doing. I knew like four people. Um, but it was very nice of them to, to give that to me. Um, and then uh, and then I did, um, in Los Angeles, I did uh, LA Opera. I did Romeo and Juliet, the opera there. Yeah. And um, I was on the stunt team. And uh, and that was cool. I you know it was like four thousand people I think at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion you know where I'd seen the Oscars done many times and it was uh, Placido Domingo was runs the whole thing and he was conducting and it was it was a surreal experience it was it was very cool I still prefer the medium of film but stage work definitely gives you a really solid foundation as a performer. Yeah, well, uh, one thing with stage is there is no second take. And so it really no, will work no, on you. No, there's not. <laughs> that's, that's part of the reason why I was like, I didn't, I, I stopped doing stage. I'll happily choreograph stage work. That's fine. But as far as performing, I'm like, not only, I mean, the money is better with film. So that initially is like, okay, I'm going to take that. But also just the pressure of stage work because there is no second take. Yeah. And, you know, that it's, it's too much. It's too much for my little heart to handle. It's just too much. <laughs> I understand that. I don't know if I ever told you this, but yeah. uh, I choreographed and performed for the Nutcracker for a local ballet. So I was the Rat King. Did you? And so I was on stage nice. with this giant faux rat head that I could barely see out of working with children's ballet. And the uh, organizer loved it because I brought more of a violence to it. And on my first one, I was I picked up this one little girl and threw her as three of the other Nutcracker armies soldiers mm-hmm. strangled the uh, strangled the Nutcracker until Clara stabbed me wow. in the back with my own sword. <laughs> wow. Suddenly it got real. This nutcracker <laughs> yeah. just got very real. All right. It's great. I wish I'd seen that. Uh, so when I notice on your credits that you are not just a stuntman and actor, but you're also a stunt choreographer and a stunt coordinator. And what's the difference between those two? Okay. Yeah. Um, um, I left that one on there just because I wanted to like clarify that because sometimes there's productions where I they they'll credit me one way and it's just a matter of you know they they logged it incorrectly. There's a stunt coordinator, there's a fight choreographer, or a fight director, or a um, uh, fight choreographer, fight coordinator, stunt coordinator. These are all in the same vein, obviously. The stunt coordinator takes care of the entire department, the stunt department. The fight coordinator or fight choreographer, interchangeable, you you can call it whatever you want, takes care specifically of the fights. That's their only job, really. Um, And then stunt choreographer is not really a thing, so if that's on there, then somebody listed that incorrectly. I I don't think it was me. Um, I'm not a stunt coordinator, per se. I don't consider myself one. as a whole, I've coordinated uh, myself on, you know, uh, a project or two where they didn't, you know, production didn't bring in a stunt coordinator, but they have me doubling like a lead actor for like a day or something. I think there was a show that I did um, where they double credited me essentially because I was overseeing things and I was taking care of the actors and I had pads for everybody. So it was was, um, kind of doubled up. Uh, but I definitely don't consider myself um, a stunt coordinator. Fight choreographer, I can I can take care of and I can do that. Um, and there have been some productions where like 98% of the stunts are fights and I'm the fight coordinator. So it's like I'm, in this particular case, as good as a stunt coordinator because that's all they're doing. But I don't, there's a lot of politics around around all of that and what qualifies you as a stunt coordinator, et cetera. And I'm 
still, you know, new and I don't have nearly the skill set that a lot of people do. Um, and I would never presume to be, you know, that level or, or a, a stunt coordinator. Cool. Uh, let them do that and I'll take care of fights and that's fine. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, follow up on the two because I see both of them there. But that actually takes me, I want to go back to your roles. Uh, you were the stunt double for Jack Ryan on the TV show Jack Ryan on, on Amazon Prime. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, a story about being on set and where did you film? Was it Tunisia? Um, it was not Tunisia. Um, I did, I doubled um, John for season two of Jack Ryan. I didn't do the first season. It's funny, I didn't do the first season. I was called about doing it and if there's any interest and then the coordinator checked my height and at the time I didn't know how tall I was because I was doubling somebody who was slightly shorter than me. And I'd been doubling him on a, on a show for a while, not John, but somebody else. And so I was like, oh yeah, I'm six foot one. And they're like, oh, John's six foot three, you're too short, can't do it. And I'm like, one, I can, I could wear a lift. I can, I can, it's, you know, it's not that, we don't need to be that dialed in. Uh, and so I guess they, they passed on me. <clears throat> and that first season was in France and Canada and Morocco was where it was. And then um, the second season came about and, um, and I was pushed to do it again. Um, and I, I accepted, you know, and um, then when I was going to get my vaccines and things, cause I had to like leave, I only got notified like a week or two in advance of, of like six months of my life being taken up wow. and um, or five months. And uh and I get measured, and I'm exactly his height. I'm 6'3", precisely. <laughs> so had I known, I could have done the first season, potentially. Who knows? But, um, but yeah, we, we shot in uh, Colombia in a few places, um, in, in Bogota, in Quirodot, and um, Cartagena. And, um, and that was super cool. The stunt team down there was fantastic. Um, we got a couple different coordinators who were working because it was a there was always multiple units going on. It was, it's, it's television, but it's high budget television that shoots like a movie. There's only eight episodes, um, but it's shot over the course of five, six months plus pickups, um, which just for comparison, you know, if you're doing an episodic, a lot of the time it's like you get maybe two weeks for an episode, for one episode. And you shoot that off in like a week and a half to two weeks and then you're done. You move on to the next episode. This one was shot completely out of order and oh. far fewer episodes over a much longer period of time. So it was basically like shooting a movie that was, you know, an eight hour movie. Um, and so we, we were in Colombia for three months and then we went over to the UK and we shot in London for uh, another month and then came back to, then there was a splinter unit that went off to Moscow, which I didn't get to go do, unfortunately. And, um, and then we came back to the States. We did New York. There's another splinter unit that went over to Washington, D.C., and then we finished up in Los Angeles, and then I know they, a part of the team went back and did Columbia again for, like, another month or something like that during pickups, which Stunts was not involved in, because we nailed it the first time. We did not need pickups. <laughs> it was all good. Um, but it was great. Uh, in the U.K., there was another guy who was also doubling for John um, named Johnny Mack, who's incredible. He's fantastic. Um, but they did they did a whole pre -viz of the sequence over there while I was still in Colombia, And so by the time I got there, he'd already done it and he'd already rehearsed it. And so they just tag teamed us out. And, uh, but you know, Johnny had already rehearsed this whole sequence on rooftops in, um, in London that were historic rooftops. So you can only have like 20 people up there total, like 20 crew members. And you can't step on any of the tiles or any of, you know, you have to walk in these little paths. So, you know, 90% of the crew is stuck in the building, not really knowing what's going on. People who'd already rehearsed it are up top, jumping around, getting everything done or trying to as best as they could. And the team did a fantastic job there as well. Um, New York, we had another different stunt coordinator. Every time we moved locations, it was a different stunt coordinator. And, uh, and we'd come back and, you know, we'd shoot this, this action sequence in, uh, in New York, which was an assassination attempt in a bathroom, and I'd shot 
the the following scene where we you know run out of the room i shot that like five months later in bogota in colombia and trying to match all wow. that i'm like i it's it was it was it was a lot it was yeah it was great it was great um and uh what else can i say that was definitely definitely the coolest job i've done with the travel and the uh the different teams and the the internationalness of the crew because we had you know we had colombians we had spaniards we had brits we had um i think a few irish crew members scottish crew members south african team uh doing the the water work uh americans it was it was a big international um expedition essentially big international adventure which is kind of what jack ryan's all about is international yeah. travel and adventure and espionage so sounds like it was just an, that. Sounds like it was just an amazing time. Yes. So I understand that you also worked on Man in the High Castle. That's filmed up in Vancouver, isn't it? It is. It is. Um, I was brought in to do work doubling one of the leads, actually on the pilot, which was not shot in Vancouver, but it was shot in Seattle. Um, so they did a whole. I think that when I was working there, it was funny because we had this really long night where everybody's dressed up, <clears throat> everybody's in costume, got a bunch of Nazis walking around, and we had a whole, you know, couple city blocks just done like, you know, 1950s um, Nazi-occupied Boston, I think is where it was set. And um, it was weird, swastikas everywhere, people dressed like that and i'm like okay guys because we'd see ex you know people just walking past set just civilians just people looking in and giving us looks and i'm like i suggest anybody wearing this badge don't walk off set you're dressed yeah. like a nazi please stay in this area <laughs> things are gonna get weird um but yeah that was that was you know not the it was a quick job but it was definitely one of the more interesting sets that i've been on one of the more detailed um it, it was one of the cooler cooler jobs i'd had for sure that's a that's a really neat show that that they've got on there uh so when i was going through your bio i also saw that you have a credit as writer and producer how has how have you found that your acting has helped you as a writer or as a producer um, I mean, the acting helps immensely in, in all the areas, for sure. But as far as the writing and producing, I've only done a little bit. So I, um, the first thing that I was doing was uh, I was contributing to Robert Chapin's web series called The Hunted, which had been going on for, for some time already, and it's based on user content. So everybody would put in their own episodes, produce their own episodes, um, and it was done in such a way that it was very easy to do because it was documentary style. Um, but it was loads of fun, and I did maybe 15 episodes that were up to, you know, between five and ten minutes long. And um, there were a couple couple competitions that they had that I put in some episodes, and we won some stuff. And then, um, and then we also did, uh, I helped with my mentor, Anthony DeLongis. We produced a couple short films that kind of comprised a series that um, uh, were westerns set in... Um, very old west essentially zorro-esque era so we still had swords um as well as very uh fundamental firearms and um the acting and uh and stunt background definitely heavily influenced um what we are able to do as far as depth of content specificity of um content and um and then of course the execution but that was that was loads of fun and so we got um we did that with the film international film festival in mind um anthony was being presented with um i think it was the dragon award it was the equivalent of, of like a, a lifetime achievement not a lifetime achievement but highly achieving award so he was getting that and we wanted to, to put in uh, um an entry and then one i think best western for that or best action short and the following year we did another one that was bigger budget more people more action um and then that also won uh, one of the two best action or best uh, best western. So we we got two awards for those, 
Um, what else? Those are the main things that I'd, I'd helped helped to write and produce. Um, and you know, when coming up with content like that, I think it's important to have an acting background or an action background if it's going to be action oriented. Yeah. For sure. Um, otherwise, your writing is going to be super vague, and you know. <laughs> Which sometimes is great. Sometimes I want to look at the page and have it say they fight, and then I, we just come up with the accent on the spot. Better to have that than somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about trying to write really specific action. And I just go, okay, this is meaningless, and I'm just going to rewrite this portion and try to come up with you know something that's equivalent to what they uh, they had in mind. Earlier, you had mentioned that you started martial arts as a child. Uh, what styles have you studied and, well, I want to get into what you're doing now, but previously, what styles have you studied? I started um, training in martial arts. I started uh, Wado Ryu Karate, which was what was available. Also, relatively uh, rare, I've, I've come to find out. It's not the most, most popular um, variety of out there. And then I studied, I studied um, Mudok Kwan Taekwondo um, for seven or eight years, which was great. I, I was really lucky that I had a teacher who trained a lot, um, who came from the Inosanto Academy, who was teaching this um, at this. So while I was there, he um, separately we'd studied some Eskrima, some Kali um, uh, sticks and knives. Uh, and that was around the same time that I was starting to study European weapons from a stage combat point of view to get me kind of introduced to the concept of rapier and longsword. Um, and uh, so I studied those, and then I cross-trained a little bit with Wing Chun concepts because, again, my my mentor was, uh, at the time, he cross-trained quite a bit with Ron Balicki and Diana Inosanto and, and Guru Dan himself. Um, and so we worked on some some uh, Wing Chun and, and Jeet Kune Do concepts. And then uh, after that, um, Western boxing, uh, Muay Thai, I've definitely done Muay Thai a bunch on and off, and um, and a bunch of boxing on and off with uh, Anthony, started to introduce me to concepts of that, and then I studied at a couple different schools in the Northwest. Um, what else? Uh, uh, a lot more Eskrima, a lot more Kali, a lot more Knife, um, and then through Anthony, a whole lot of, you know, European work, a lot of saber, a lot of rapier, um, and, you know, uh, long sword as well. Um, not to the degree that you're familiar with it, which is always why it's a treat being able to train with you, because then I'm like, it just opens up floodgates once I see what you're doing. Um, and then that inspires me to dig deeper and, and go further, which is great. And then uh, about 14, 13 years ago, I think, I started uh, started studying Shinkendo, which is Japanese sword work um, that I studied with Matthew Lynch, who's uh, one of the top teachers under Toshishiro Obata, who runs the school um, and the International Federation. And so now I'm teaching that, uh, and I've, I've got my, my teaching certification in 2013. And then I've taught on and off, and now I'm trying to get more consistent with the with the instruction because lately my my training in Shinkendo has gone deeper and deeper, and my my interest has gone further. Um, and it's it's a passion of mine, and so I, I like to share it. And I think it's it's also really good for the stunt community because I see a lot of misconceptions about what Japanese sword is um, and how it functions. And there's a whole lot of mystery around it that doesn't need to be there um and there's a whole lot of misconception that it's essentially like wushu which is you know a lot of a lot of spinning and a lot of dance and it's a wonderful performance art but it's not it's not a fighting art really um and that's what people think japanese sword is so i'm kind of out to, to help the stunt community understand what it is which functions a lot more like european longsword so the people who can't necessarily train in really good European longsword. I'm saying if you cross train and you get a longsword on set and you've trained with a whole lot of katana, you make some tweaks and we're able to make this a, a reasonable stunt fight. Um, even though you haven't trained extensively with longsword, you've trained a whole bunch with katana and you've done it well. Not the spinny version, but, <laughs> but the, you know, something more reasonable. Um, we can always make it flashier if we need to without spinning, but. Um, 
yeah, so that's that's what I'm studying a whole bunch right now, and that's what I'm teaching. Cool. Now, uh, Shinkendo is not Kendo. Can you tell us what the difference is between Shinkendo and Kendo, or Kenjitsu, for those that know what that is? Yeah. Um, Shinkendo, as a more direct translation, um, Kendo is just you know, the way of the sword. Kendo is specifically the sport of, um, is the equivalent of, of Olympic fencing to European more classical fencing or sword fighting as a real martial art. Um, you're going for points, you're going for, you know, that that's all it is. Uh, you've got specified targets. That's what Kendo is. Um, and you're using a shinai, which is very lightweight and longer, uh, it's great for speed and reflexes, um, and, and that's fine, but it won't teach you how to use a real sword. And a shinken specifically translates to a real sword, which means it's sharp, it's made of steel, it can do the job. Um, so shinkendo specifically means the way of the real sword, or shin translated differently or written differently uh, means specifically... Um, to do something honestly, or to do something with heart, Shin also translates to heart. So earnest, honest, real, full-hearted training and full-hearted way of the sword uh, is is kind of what it means. And it's different from kendo in just that. It's it's more real techniques that are combatively viable. Um, it's not a sport per se. Uh, and it's a modern Budo art. It was the school itself was started in 1990, I believe, that it was started in the United States by Toshihiro Obata. Obata trained in a bunch of older styles uh, in Japan and got extensive training and, and certified in many different arts. And he found that in Japan, all, all these arts were um, kind of fragmented in that each system was not necessarily a full system. They'd have certain systems of Kenjutsu that focused on sparring in one particular way, or they didn't focus on drawing at all. They just focused on, you know, the sword's already out and we're, we're doing this. Or you have Yaido, which is the art of drawing and resheathing the sword, which again is great, but it's not, it's not a fighting art. It's specifically a meditation on drawing and resheathing the sword. And there are people who are interested in that, and that's great. Um, but, you know, sometimes they don't practice enough, enough target cutting. Um, so Shinkendo is specifically comprised of five different elements. You have, you have five rings of Shinkendo, which is sword swinging, drawing and resheathing, uh, solo forms, which are more performance-oriented in some ways, or they highlight certain, certain uh, elements of it. Tachiuchi, which is, which is partner practice, partner drills. Um, extensive numbers of, of partner drills, which is essentially like as close to sparring as you can possibly come, and then tamashigiri, which is which is test cutting, and um, and there's also a lot of misconception about the test cutting that's out there because the targets that you see people cutting are sometimes as soft as jello, and you don't necessarily know that because you can't see it. It's online. You can't go and feel the target. You can't see how long it was soaked. You don't you don't know. Um, also, the type of sword that they're using. If you have a really wide, thin blade and a really soft target, you can go through that thing like it's like it's nothing and do all these cool trick shots. But then if you get a sword that you're actually going to want to use, which is a little thicker, a little beefier, and then you get a target that is bamboo or a tatami mat that's much stronger than the last tatami mat, they're not all the same, it'll quickly reveal the flaws in your technique or, or what you're great at. Right. Um, so we don't necessarily do that. There's, there's performance cutting, which is one thing, and then there's test cutting to see how good your cuts are. Um, that's what I'm more interested in than the performance aspect of it. And there is truth in your technique in what the, uh, what the cut itself looks like. One of, one of my favorite stories, mm -hmm. and it's from the novel, about Musashi's life, Miyamoto Musashi's life called Musashi. Uh, he wants to challenge the founder of, or the, the head of a family and they won't let him in because he's this nobody. So he draws his sword and cuts a flower out of his, 
out of the garden and says, well, please give this to him with my compliments. And when it's delivered to him, the, the master says, wait a minute, who did this? And they're like, this, this Ronin outside. Well, I want to see him. And they're like, oh, he's going to be in trouble. And the whole idea was the cut itself was so clean and such a nice angle that there was truth about him and his training to be seen in the cut itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's, there's definitely, there's a lot that's shown in technique in the cut. That's, and that's a great example. And that's essentially how we use it. I mean, you know, you see a lot of people posting on YouTube, all these crazy cuts and everything. And I'm like, that's, that's not what interests me so much. You can do performance cuts and that's great. But like, I like using it as a reflection of my training and it teaches me about myself and how to improve. And that's what's more interesting to me and showing off how, how crazy a cut can I manage. Um, but yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And that's, that's what I like about Shin Kendo is that it, it definitely keeps you honest as a martial artist and as a, as a swordsman. Um, and that's, it's, it's rare to find that in a lot of schools. So I'm, I'm lucky to have, have fallen in line with, with, um, with that particular school. How did you fall in, or how did you find uh, Sensei Lynch and this, this school? Um, this school, uh, it was, so I was training with my, my teacher, Anthony, and he had uh, a friend of his and a friend of mine now, um, Luke LaFontaine, who's also an extremely accomplished sound man. He's up for a Taurus Award this year for best, best fight um, and uh, really good fight choreographer. Uh, and extremely, extremely proficient with Japanese. Um, and he'd studied in Shin Kendo. And he's been a lifelong martial artist and a, and a really good, honest martial artist as well. So his opinion on where to go train was, was uh, well-respected. And so he'd been training with Sensei Matthew Lynch. And so then Anthony started training with him and I started training with him. And once I, I started training with Matthew, his teaching style was very much in line with um, the way that I think and the way that I approach things. And, uh, and the system itself was so undisputedly um, well-rounded um, and its progression, the longer I train in it, has you know, proven itself to be extremely effective as well as um, very satisfying. So that's, that's how I got into it and that's why I have continued. Yeah, Luke is a really talented man, both in martial arts as well as fight choreography. I will be sitting down and talking with him as well. And so that brings good. up. Oh, good. That's good. Oh, yeah. Definitely have him. I have some interviews lined up with Luke and with Anthony. Brilliant. And uh, so that brings me up to another thing I wanted to mention that. Um, well, actually, two things. One that's on your bio, and that's your whip work. So you work with bull whips as well. Tell us a little bit yeah, about um, doing that and what you do with the bull whips. Um, yeah, whip. Whip is um, whip's an odd tool. It's a fun weapon. It's unique. Um, I started I started training before I met Anthony. Actually, I, I had about a year or two with my first instructor. Um, Abe Paterka was his name. He's the same same man who introduced me to sword work in the Midwest. And then, um, and we were working on basic concepts and basic cracks. And then I went and I trained with Anthony for the first time. And I absolutely wanted to pick up a bullwhip because um, it's such a cool tool. It's yeah. supersonic, you know, braided rope. It's it's fantastic and it's iconic. And not a lot of people do it. And not a lot of people do it well. Um, and Anthony just ramped. He opened up a world of possibility with it. Um, whip is an incredible teaching tool that functions, um, as Anthony puts it, it's, it's like a, a supersonic telescoping sword, essentially, is what it is. Um, it works long range, it works short range, it's the coolest flexible weapon out there, um, I think. And so Anthony opened up uh, a, a new universe of that for me, which was great. And it, the cool thing about Whip, um, much like target cutting with sword, is that it teaches you how to be better. The way the Whip cracks, the way the Whip functions, and the way it moves 
because it's so responsive, there's no other no other weapon like it that I've found um, because it amplifies all the energy that you put into it. Every other flexible weapon is is great and it uses momentum, but it doesn't compound the momentum and the energy that you put into it the way the whip does because it's tapered um, and because it has a natural loop to it, which Anthony's and now my signature style um, uses. Uh, we we use that natural loop and curve to the advantage of, uh, well, to our advantage. Um, so when we do our cracks and when we do our patterns, we're using it essentially like a sword or, you know, we can use it to wrap and we can use the handle as a baton, essentially. Um, it's, it's been an incredibly cool Zen meditative tool as well as something that has, has improved my footwork improved my sense of awareness because the whip compounds everything you do it listens to absolutely everything and it will do everything that you say um but because it will do that you need to know everything that your body is saying and most people especially when they start their body is saying like 12 different things but they only want the whip to do one thing so quieting the body to one point so that you can then drive your intention to just one concept is a powerful meditative tool that that crosses over into sword work, stick work, acting work. It's when you let the philosophy of it carry over, it it's a very powerful, very powerful tool. Uh, having trained with Anthony myself in whip a little bit, nowhere near as extensive as you, the big thing that I took away from it and that I remember him saying is the whip is going to go exactly where you tell it to go which means if you hit yourself that's because you told the whip to go where your body was oh yeah oh yeah that's that's absolutely true and everybody everybody that I introduced to whip goes oh boy I'm gonna need pads I'm gonna hit myself or oh I've tried this before and I've you know tagged myself a bunch and um I still can pride myself. I think I've maybe have hit myself once legitimately with a whip. And it's only when I was messing around knowing that I was putting myself in danger. You know, if I, <laughs> if I go like, I wonder if I could possibly do, and then I hit myself the one time and I'm like, can't do that. Okay. So learn the lesson. Um, but if you learn the physics and you learn the system that Anthony has constructed, you'll never hit yourself. Uh, you'll only hit yourself if, atmospherics get involved so if there's an outside force that's then acting on it that's something that's you know you try to mitigate as much as possible or um if there's a flaw in your technique but if you're really quiet and you pay attention and you build your technique well you won't have those those errors but this is this is what makes the system so great to teach to actors and stunt performers when precision is key um and there's so much room for error especially with a whip on set um it's just there's you cannot afford to have anything go wrong. So being this specific and precise is necessary. And it really focuses you on where you are in space and in your mindset all at the same time. Oh, very much so. Very much so. I can see people with, with any martial art, but I find especially with whip, people reveal a lot about their own internal workings through the way that they practice and through their level of patience and through you know, how they, they overcome these barriers, mostly in their mind, um, but then also physically and, and how they approach that. And that's part of the teaching method is, you know, it teaches you how to learn. And that's as far as like Anthony's system as a whole, especially the whip, but across the board with swords and everything else. That's what I've, I think I've found the most valuable is that he teaches you how to learn yeah. um, and how, how to break things down um, into the physics of it, and 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 uh, that's remarkably useful information that not a lot of people give out, and not a lot of people understand. Speaking of being in yourself and understanding where you are, both physically and mentally, emotionally, even you do combat on horseback. Is that right? Yes, that's true. Yeah. Uh, so. Tell us a little bit, I mean, there's a lot of people that ride horses. There's a lot of people that do martial arts. There's not a lot of people that do martial arts on horseback. 
tell us yeah, a little bit about that. Um, yeah, horseback weapons work and horseback martial arts is it's kind of its own thing because you need you need to have a solid riding background. So my my, my partner Michelle Shock and I run run our company Equity and Ace, and we teach people horseback riding and weapons work and weapons on horseback. And you need to approach each each element of it as its own thing. So Michelle has been a horseback instructor, hunter jumper, um, many accolades for a long time. And she's an expert in that field. Um, And uh, because she's already got that foundation, she can easily add the weapons work because we're working weapons together as well. And uh, and essentially what happens is the, the horse becomes your footwork because now your horse is determining your distances and your speeds and how to deliver your attack and how to get out of range. It's exactly just what it is. It's, it's now instead of two feet, you have four. Um, you also have another brain to take care of. That's, that's the tricky that's part. That's a big one. <laughs> that's a big one, yeah. It, it has its own opinions, and uh, you have to take that into account. So if you're not aware of how a horse's um, mentality is or how they, they function, you, you're missing a whole lot. So acclimating a horse and desensitizing a horse to the props that you're working with or the weapons that you're working with, um, the targets, the the area that you're going to be in um that's all part of part of should be part of your horse training um having having a sense of uh the emotional and mental aspect of horses and then weapons work you train on the ground all the stuff that you've trained on the ground most of it still applies you just now take it up to horseback and you're now doing it at different speeds and slightly different distances um so we, we teach kind of from the ground up, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a unique thing. And then when people are comfortable and they get to a certain point, um, going up to Anthony's place to ride and train up there, which is a whole nother level of riding because they ride crazy terrain, and it's, it's loads of fun. And uh, his weapons work is extremely specific. So he'll definitely like hone that in. Um, but we'll we'll do, you know, sword work, stick work to work up to sword work, whip work if you're ready. Um, on horseback. In the lance. Whip work on horseback. Yes, it's if you thought whip was difficult while you're just standing there, <laughs> doing it on a horse is just like another world of trouble to get yourself into. Um, so you got to be extremely confident with all these skills before you get on a horse. You, your horse work has to be solid. Your whip, whip work has to be super solid. Um, yeah. So and there's talk, there's a there's a lot to go into it. And talk about having to acclim- acclimate the horse to what you're doing. The the sound of the whip cracking around it, or yeah. even even climbing onto the back of a horse with. Uh, arrows rattling around in a quiver. Yeah, Michelle does uh, horseback archery, and so there's there's a whole process that we have to take the horses through to acclimate them to the sounds of arrows in a quiver, to the sound of a bowstring, to the sound of things knocking around, because they'll they'll be, you know, certain horses are completely fine with one thing, and then for no apparent reason, they just don't like one particular element of a situation. You know, they might not care about the sound of a whip, but the the look of it, it looks like a snake, it makes a loud boom. There's there's really nothing worse for a horse than a whip. It was designed to drive cattle and make animals move. So now you're asking the horse to stay completely still and trust you entirely, um, which is why because the horse has given you all that trust, you'd better not mess it up. Yeah. That's all, that whole relationship relies on you and that horse trusting you. Um, so if you get up there and, and you mess it up, you're taking yourself on a number of steps back and then you need to regain that trust. That would be like, um, if we think about, uh, old cavalry firing guns from the back of a horse over its head, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the, the the amount of training that, uh, the, the amount of training and teamwork that must be between the rider and the horse to allow that guy to fire the weapon from horseback. Oh yeah. oh yeah, no, there's definitely, um, that's, that is certainly an element that you need to take into consideration is, is, is building all that trust, but also it, 
depending on the time period, when horses were a lot more readily available and more dispensable, they got away with a whole lot. But we don't have that option now, especially in, in, in this time. We care for the horse's well-being. Um, so we can't just get on there and go nuts and then send the horse on its way, having mentally and emotionally start it. Well, yeah. We can, we can, but, you know, we'd be horrible people if we did that. So we, we try not to. So we take care of the horses and have to work them up. Um, yeah, I think that was the end of my thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kendall, I want to thank you for taking time and talking with me. Um, I really appreciated getting to know you. Uh, unfortunately, I've only had the chance to physically be in the same place with you, I think, three or four times. Yeah, yeah, but we need to do more tests together. I agree. And and um, my last question uh, before, well, actually, I have two questions before we go. In your acting career, what is your favorite place that you've gone to work? Ooh, favorite place that I've gone to work? Um, I'd, pr I'd probably have to say, I think it was, I'd have to be on Jack Ryan. I think it was in, in the UK, it was in London. They had a sting. I, I was there for about a month and every morning I'd get up and I'd go for a run and like out my window, I could see, you know, it was Buckingham Palace it was just right there. So I just go for a jog around the palace. <laughs> do the whole thing and then go to work that was a pretty nice spot that was a pretty cool place I yeah have to say. yeah run around it the palace nice. as one does run around the palace you know do the whole thing and then again jack ryan i think one of my favorite moments as far as locations go there was a high-speed boat getaway in the middle of the night and it was a full moon and it was in the outskirts of the amazon and i just had a couple moments like that where i'm just looking up at the moon i'm just Got all my all my gear on, holding this firearm and doing the whole thing, and I'm just zooming down this river at night and going, God, I'm getting paid to do this. This is insane. <laughs> this is beautiful. It's great. Yeah. Probably probably those two moments. Fantastic. And my last question, I like to ask this of everybody that I've spent time with. Um, We've not spent a lot of time together, but what's something that you remember about something that we've done together? That we've done together? Oh, God. Yeah. Um, uh, anytime you open your mouth in a training session, I'm completely attentive. I think that the insights that you give as far as um, Western martial arts, go, and martial arts in general, but specifically we've been working on longsword or something, um, have been remarkably insightful. Um, and I take... I take all that information into account. And I, I specifically try to, to apply it um, towards choreography that I'm doing and as an insight to any other weapons that I've picked up. I think that your, uh, your training approach is very similar to a number of other instructors that I've worked with. So it clicks really well with me and it makes it extremely easy to teach and inform other people as well, which is really important for me as a, as a, as a fight coordinator. So the way that you break things down and explain them is so logical, it can't really be refuted, which is great. <laughs> and I think, what was it? I think you demoed, because I hadn't heard the term before, head juggling. Oh, I, think you, right. I, think, I think you demoed it on me, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'd be so screwed if we ever got into an altercation. I'd be so toast. There's nothing. I'm just like, it would be, yeah, but uh, head juggling. I do remember that. And I was like, <laughs> good to know. Good to know. Keeping that away, filed away in my brain. <laughs> Fantastic. So if you don't know what head juggling is, look up head juggling. See if you can find that. And then just imagine me quickly off balance. Uh, yeah. And that was over overlooking the canyon yeah, on the platform place on on the infinity deck it was like the sun was setting and it was overlooking the canyon it was a brilliant location it was great it was great so i want to thank you so much for taking time to sit down and talk with me kindle it's always a pleasure to catch up with you you're always, always. an amazing actor a talented stuntman a fantastic martial artist and more importantly than all of that, you're just a nice guy. 
Thanks. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Always great to talk. Yes. You take care, my friend. We'll talk soon. Cool. That was a lot of fun. Thank you for taking time to talk to me, Kendall. It is always a pleasure to get to see you and talk to you. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button right below at the corner. Subscribe to our channel. We have lots of videos of interviews with professionals, both in martial arts as well as the movie industry. And we have videos on this channel also from myself teaching. Thanks again for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed talking to Kindle.